there's a musician that I work with a lot who leaves little notes in his recording. He, he records from home. And, uh, and so, you know, I'll get, he's a guitarist and bass player and stuff. And so I'll get these tracks and I'll be importing them into my session and starting to the, you know, mix and, and, and apply the, the polish and whatnot needed to, to get these things to the finish line. And then I'll see in the waveform, there's like, there's like a little rogue sound kind of off somewhere outside of where he was supposed to be playing. So I go and isolate that. And invariably it's like, hello, Austin. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> And the best, the best part is when I'm working quickly and I don't see it. And so I'm just doing, and I just hear this voice and it's like, <laughs> and I think, I think I hallucinate. So I keep, and it just becomes this thing until finally I realize Tom. So I start like hunting. I'm like, it's in here somewhere. Uh, cause, and there've been a couple of times where I almost shipped a mix that had one of those things in there where, cause it was, it was like loud and he whispered. So in context, mm-hmm. it was basically impossible to hear, but you'd catch the sibilant, like, <laughs> And so you can't you can't hear that there's a a word you can't hear what it is only that it's there. I won't I, like, I won't say which game of ours it is, but there's a game of ours that definitely ships with an audio track of me going <coughs> of me going. This is placeholder, Mike. You got to fucking delete this before you launch the game. Was in the was in the <laughs> wow. game. Wow, um, excellent. I thought you meant the cough, that and I was like, "Is you coughing?" And no, the cough, the cough. Yeah, well, that's yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I probably also coughed. I cough a lot, so it's fine. At IGN, there was one specific producer who, when he had a headset on, if we were like at an event, and I still was having, I still had my microphone, and he was talking to someone, I would just whisper shit in the microphone, but specifically time it to when he was having a conversation because I knew he'd always be able to hear it. Never got in a break. One of the worst ones for that for me was the day at E3, which as press is like just exhausting. You're falling apart. Mm. And I was also very hungover, um, which is a bad combination. Maybe two hours sleep, very hungover. And I was the first interview of the day. And the person I was interviewing was Japanese and they had a translator. Uh, so my producer in my ear decided to fake translate in my IFB while I was doing the interview and pretend <laughs> to guess what he was saying based on his hand movements. So the person that I was interviewing I love would that be that, like, that's and he'd be like, the and badness. then you whip it in a circle. And I, I was just like, oh. The challenge of that moment is not even, it's not even necessary that you have no sleep and be hungover for that to be a daunting experience. But I love the, just that extra extra bit of spice that it you know it's through this like blurry lens of your it might have helped that i was more immune to it because i was like i don't know what's going on it was he was a great interview it was very interesting but it was also on hard mode and just the minute that i was done i was like what if i had laughed in his face what would you have done he's like i knew you wouldn't you were fine jesus christ but i do like fucking with people when they have headphones on it's a good time there's lots of fun to be had there highly recommended across the board uh, but I did have a thing that I wanted to ask the two of you about today, but I don't know if you've even seen it. Did you see the Unreal 5 update? I've not watched it yet. I need to watch I, that. I, uh, <clears throat> I queued it up because I know there were a lot of uh, audio uh, updates that were making the rounds amongst my my peers. It is uh, fascinating. And some folks that I, yeah, some folks I know who, at Epic worked really hard on, on some of that specific tech um, and were sharing it with a little bit of a like, you know, like, like Tom Hanks going, oh, I have made fire. <laughs> and uh, I so I was really stoked to check it out. I, I this week has been uh, a bit bananas. Mm-hmm. So I Sorry. have not had a chance to uh, check it out yet. Only only that it's supposedly quite awesome. It is. I recognize that I should have asked you both ahead of time. Yeah, I'm just going to ask you to talk about it because it, it's really, really cool. Like, I guess E3 started this week. So obviously we saw uh, Horizon oh. Forbidden West and it looks beautiful. Far Cry was this morning, and I almost woke up at 2.30 a.m. to watch that, and then it turns out the 2.30 a.m. time, again, Australian time, was for a 30-minute countdown timer. <laughs> My morning was messed up anyway, but if I had have woken up for that, that and then had to wait me. 30 minutes, I would have been like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> oh my mm-hmm. god. If any of those happen for the rest of this E3 period where I have to wake up at 3 a.m., I'm going to murder somebody. Does that mean that we're in this, like, is it like E3 month? Because I definitely have E3 related things that I obviously can't get into any detail on, but which are, you know, happening. And, and, um, I thought that they were, they're definitely not today. I have a great Uh, way to phrase that. I would say, yeah, we're in E3 month, but I think at this point, E3 begins at the end of May and then goes to the end of August. Like, that's what it feels like to me now. Okay. Yeah. It's. 
Interesting. I wonder. I wonder if you know a year from now, they'll think there was a lot to be gained by not trying to consolidate everything into those couple of days. And you know, mm-hmm. even if they bring a live, you know, LA Convention Center component to it again, um, if that would be kind of you know, here's our final weekend, but it's been weeks of build up that we're just going to kind of call E3 now. Well, the EA you know, like- conference has already <clears throat> been announced for July twenty second. So that's way out of regular E3. Um, yeah, right. Xbox. Well, this was this was normal. Ubisoft is normal. Sorry. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say, like this. This was even like pre these exceptional times we're living through. Um, this was already a thing that, like, I've I've spoke. I remember speaking to several like platform holders and publishers where everyone was jealous of the Nintendo Direct. Everyone, mm. everyone was <laughs> yeah. looking at that and going, <clears throat> Nintendo own the universe of games for like three days every nintendo direct and everyone wanted to kind of re- reproduce that so i think it was already heading in that direction i think they'll still do the razzmatazz events as well but like yeah the idea of like for yeah especially for like an ubisoft or an ea like having an event that's just yours that no one else is dropping any news because that was the thing with e3 is you're in combat with absolutely everyone mm. else to get any attention right. um and all it takes is it, it, it creates a very extreme difference between winners and losers. You know, each E3, there's like five things that get all gamers are aware happened at that E3. Yeah. But there is hundreds of things that's fired and cost the people who are working on them lots of money to try and get that attention. So I, I, I think we'll do the event still, but I, I bet the Nintendo Direct model is going to be with us, I think, from now on. Well, PlayStation's <laughs> already doing it with State of Play. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Um, obviously, that. Nintendo is consistently doing it, and I love the Nintendo Direct. So I think they're so much fun they're to watch. They're lovely. Um, yeah, they're really nice events. Yeah. EA broke out a while ago for EA Play, which obviously, again, they're doing this year in July. But I wouldn't be surprised if post pandemic they start doing another in person thing that times out with the E3 event itself. Mm-hmm. Um, Ubisoft and Xbox are around the same time as E3. I think they're the 12th and the 13th, but all my dates are wrong because I'm in a different time zone. So who knows anyway? But yeah, I mean, I feel like. The, the value of E3 has to prove itself even harder now that we know that press can do preview events digitally. Mm-hmm. That what is the purpose of having that show? Because it is five days rather than, you know, the conferences aren't actually run by the ESA. They're totally separate. Everyone chose to do that. I totally agree. The publishers have almost no point to do them at the same time, especially now that they yeah. can just make them digitally. There's just no reason to do it. So the event itself has to have some extreme value to press or it has to go full comic con and just become a fan show with cosplay and panels right. that also include tv and movies and entertainment and it it seems like i don't actually know this but the the e3 presentation conference stuff they're doing this year um this might have changed but the gist that i had heard last year was that keely wanted to pull out because they were focusing more on like having influencers that they'd interview or streamers that they'd interview rather than having devs or publishers that they'd interview. Right. Uh, but I don't know if that's still the case because now it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's Greg golden boy and, and Jackie uh, who are hosting it, which is also the first time the E3 has had hosts mm. outside of the Coliseum. So that's, that's what they're trying to do. I don't know. I, I don't know that there's a ton of value to press anymore. Um, obviously, there's still value to publishers, but I think you're absolutely right, Mike. And I know that they had been trying to do that for a while. That I remember when like State of Play shape. was first being talked about. I probably... No, I think I'm fine NDA-wise that State of Plays exists now. Like, like that when that was first being talked about, it was definitely like a lot of envy towards kind of the Nintendo Direct model. from, And it's been true of, of everyone since. What's interesting, you, you bring up Comic-Con, like there's even arguments that like for the big AAA publishers, events like Comic-Con don't make sense. Like, you know, you, you if you look at like what, um you know, Warner Brothers have did with, what, what did they call it? They did like their big DC universe uh, virtual. Fandom. Fandom, that was the one. And it's like, that's that's arguably better for them because they reach a bigger audience. They get, like, a Comic-Con still, you're only reaching the thousands of people there, you know. And that gives it an exclusivity and, you know, everyone knows what Hall H is and all that stuff. But, like, yeah. at the same time, like, yeah, there's, there's definitely owning the channel by which people are going to find out about your stuff and being able to bring that audience to that channel is so valuable at the big end who does really well at comic cons and who arguably does 
well at E3 and stuff like that is folks at my scale, where you're not going to come to Comic-Con for me, but if I'm there, you might stop by for 10 minutes to check out something I'm showing you. And you see that in like Artist Alley at Comic-Con and you see it in kind of the indie spaces and games conferences. Like we're the ones who kind of benefit most because it exposes us to an audience who definitely don't, you know, don't listen to this podcast, don't follow me on Twitter, don't, I don't, I can't get to via my channels that I have. Mm. So how are you going to convince them to wishlist, Mike? How can they wishlist and pre-order Solitaire Conspiracy uh, coming? I just we just announced that like an hour ago. I'm gonna I'm gonna be on that. Forever. It's on Switch. It's on Switch. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's like there is a value to that. I remember we did. I you know we were uh, um, one of the big games um, uh, shows in the UK uh, is the Eurogamer one, and we were there and we basically uh, got volume a bunch of press and interest from players just because we were essentially in the queuing area for a big AAA game. So what we did was we were just kind of grabbing people from the queue who were queuing for the big thing and saying, come over and play our game while you wait kind of thing and, and you know, holding their place in the queue and stuff. And you have to, if you do that hustle, you can kind of get some some visibility. But ultimately, like Ubisoft don't want me bothering people in their queue. They'd much rather put up a stream that they can just kind of own the airwaves for a couple of hours yeah. and, and talk to their audience. So it's going to be interesting. I, I, I don't know if we'll reset completely. As press, I did always cover the hell out of indies at every event, right? And mm. that, for them, not having an E3, I don't think will hurt as much as maybe not having a PAX or a, or a Comic-Con. That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, the thing that I don't know if this will happen or not is, like, say, the Ubisoft Forward event that's happening. Will people watch that if it's not part of a larger E3 if they don't care about Ubisoft games. Where previously, because it was like, oh, this is this week, I watch all of these conferences because it's mm -hmm. fun. That's what we do this week. Are people going to opt not to? Because, I mean, PlayStation, Nintendo, and I would say Xbox are going to be fine every time, unless it's like an indie showcase. In, in those mm -hmm. cases, I feel like they probably get less views. But I'll, I'm be interested to see. It, it's not happening this year, especially for Ubisoft specifically. Um, obviously, Bethesda's now in with Xbox, so that's not in the same mix, but how the views change this year, because some of those PlayStation conferences were getting like millions of concurrent live viewers, and if they're just doing entirely separate state of plays, I don't know if they'll hit even the same heights, because it's not like the E3 event, and mm. you're not getting people who don't necessarily buy PlayStation games. I'm, I really don't know, but I don't know that if a Ubisoft event was just in the middle of November or something, um, and they're always during a work day, <laughs> if it's going to get the same amount of hype that it would during E3 week or the same amount of views, or do they do they get the interest of people who otherwise would not watch something for their specific publisher, or do they just lose those people completely? I guess that's Does the, that's the experiment, not? right? That's the bet mm. they're making. I think as well, though, I think the way, and this is, an ongoing trend of the last couple of decades, but like the way people consume that information as well is very distributed, right? So yes, you have your hardcore, I need to see what Far Cry 6 is, so I'm going to tune in for an hour. But you also, and those people, yes, there'll probably be less of those, but the people who are going to, you know, be scrolling social media and see like a clip or a meme or a piece of content from that, arguably you're not fighting with everyone else's press conference. If you were, I remember with, um, I don't know, like, uh, well, the one that I remember because it was uh, Keanu was was Cyberpunk, right? When when he came out on stage and did his thing, the rest of E3 needn't have happened at that point, right? Like yeah, in terms of true. like the memes, the content, like like Cyberpunk just was all anyone was talking about for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And again, like at the indie scale, we definitely benefit from people thinking about Keanu Reeves a bit more, especially when we were there with John Wick. But like <laughs> the rest of the AAA there they weren't the meme. Whereas if you're Ubisoft and you can get that distance, you can be the the thing that you may mm. not be watching for a couple of hours on the at the moment it goes up, but you're probably going to see a funny image or a clip or see some of that coverage on your favorite stream. Your favorite streamer is not choosing to like put Ubisoft in a two minute segment in their summary. They're doing content about that because that's what everyone's searching for for that week, right? So it's kind of plays into where we're at right now in terms of how people actually hear about video games mm. would be my guess. I feel like the yeah the, the show floor stuff specifically, it's interesting that uh, Nintendo would always do Comic Cons. There would always be a Nintendo booth at a Comic Con. Um, mm -hmm. And I wonder why they took that approach, but obviously they had the huge, enormous booths at E3. 
And I kind of wonder if that helps with that exact thing, where being in person and taking a picture of the Breath of the Wild 2 booth and then that getting shared like crazy on Twitter is also a really helpful part of the marketing mm -hmm. strategy because those boots are fucking expensive. So like, expensive. Oh my God. One of our IGN booths one year was like the price of a house. It was mm -hmm. a two-story booth and it was like $400,000 or something. I, I could be completely wrong about that, but that's Even I feel like what scale, I remember being. I remember oh one- Oh my God. I, they're like, like, I remember points in my life where I was spending more on the booths I was showing my game in than my rent. Like that was, it was ridiculous. It's insane. Um, yeah. Like, it's it's cool, I guess, if you can see it from everywhere, but not that many people go through those holes. Three hundred thousand dollars for an IGN booth at E three can only really pay off in my head if it's in the background of a million shots and it's getting shared on Twitter. It's too much money. A lot of it, as well as like much... statements, right? Is IGN needs to be seen to be the most important game outlet, so of mm. course they've got the big booth at, at E three. So a lot yep. of it is that politics and perception as well. I remember at E three a couple of years ago they had one of the go-karts from Crash Team Racing. Um, like, or not one of them, but like they built like a dummy posable, you know, stand in line and get your photo on the go-kart, uh, mm -hmm. like right at the entrance. So it was, you know, you walk in, you stand in line f in the heat, the LA summer downtown muggy heat for an hour, you get inside and the first thing to greet you is this. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, I wonder, this was probably like a million dollar buy to place yep. this thing here yeah and i thought i wonder i wonder if there's any way there must be a way to analyze the return on that investment in terms of you know like can they can they troll tr like trawl uh social media to see you know how many shares of this photo and then in turn mm. there are companies how many that do that sales... and charge a great deal of money for the exact service you're describing that's what i was gonna um, ask is Sessler like... started one and huh. started one that did it's gonna that. be like yeah. which the question which is how many person... sales did that make yeah but i don't think that stuff necessarily translates directly that way like it depends on the company but some of it is it, it is somebody's job to make sure everybody is thinking about Crash Bandicoot and that their job mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily have to inform sales. It has to inform yep. conversation. Marketing there, somebody's metrics, got a slideshow yeah. about this somewhere where they're like, this is the amount of people who saw this image mm -hmm. of Crash Bandicoot. Here's the amount of people who actually did this. Like, here's the increase in SEO for Crash Bandicoot that we can correlate to this like that that's a big industry that that makes a lot of money <laughs> and I think that's the other thing is is it doesn't need the barrier to entry is a lot lower as well from like a sharing and discussing point of view I know developers who've made the choice to have like less games you know less game demo machines in a show in order to spend that money instead on the kind of the car outside or the kind of the gimmick because ultimately, like, for someone to step up and play your game, uh, and these are the numbers you have to start thinking about with these things, which are like, okay, so someone's going to come up, they're going to spend 15 minutes, member of the public, kind of playing our demo. We have 10 machines, 15 minutes, the thing's open for this amount of time. And you're literally doing the maths of, like, a few hundred people are going to play this. Yeah, that's um, not valuable. It's so, it's, well, it's, 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 a hard, it's a hard sell to, like, get that because you have to like you have to go well how many of those people are actually going to buy the game half and of them have already pre-ordered it exactly or told their friends or like are you getting anything from it and also there's the barrier of entry of a lot of people don't want to play games at shows or they, they they're going to be put off by you know from seeing it and stuff like that you've got a car outside everyone wants to have a selfie and what's the great thing about selfies everyone wants to share a selfie because it's them because they're the star, so they're, it, it spreads more. People like them more because they like the person in the photo, their friends, their fans, whatever. Like You can do a lot more in terms of, as you say, Alana, like mind share and all those kind of trackable values, which, yeah, marketers, like analytics on social media stuff is astonishing when you get to like the higher tier on this stuff. Um, and, 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 and crucially as well, associations, which is a big part of that, is it's not just about people hearing about Crash Bandicoot. It's people associating the, the the words Crash Bandicoot with a good feeling mm -hmm. and seeing their friend kind of having a fun time at an event in front of a Crash Bandicoot sign. That also is something that marketers will track and they'll track like how, you know, the, even like the wording in the comments, they'll realize like that that has a positive outcome. So yeah, that's as much as it's a gimmick and as much as as game developers, we'd of course love it if the best way to sell a game was to show someone a game. There are actually better ways of selling someone on your brand and your IP than letting them play the game, which is which is kind of weird. Absolutely. There's also the um, 
there's also the aspect that some games just don't lend themselves to this kind of, you know, show floor chaos mm -hmm. sort of, you know, like like Journey would be a very bad mm -hmm. game for like. But I remember a few years ago at PAX, Rami was there with um, Nuclear Throne mm -hmm. and he was like he was like this, you know, this old fashioned you know, step right up, folks. Let's see if he can do it. Like, and he was he was working this crowd around the booth where he was like, "Who wants to see if they can beat this level on the hardest mode? And if you do, we'll give you we'll comp you a copy of the game." And so there was a crowd watching these people step up, and it was it was literally like the you know, "Can I guess your weight?" or "Can you smash this sledgehammer right? onto the thing?" And Rami's and, taken and, and, on and, opportunity to demo to one exactly. person for ten minutes, and he's turned it into a hundred people in ten minutes. It's crazy. It's and, he's and, very and good the game at it. Lent though, itself. Like, yeah, he's... Well, but the game also like was the perfect game for that mm. kind of thing. Yeah. You know, it was a perfect game where you can watch someone play it. You immediately understand what kind of you know experience they are having. You're not. It's not one of those where, like, if they're in headphones listening to dialogue, you're going, I wonder what's going on with the, the you know, it's just some games really just don't, yeah. Yeah. just don't lend themselves to that. And But that was one, I remember Tooth and Tail, Andy Schatz did the same thing at, at PAX, it might have even been that same year, where they were doing, like, you know, competitive multiplayer of just getting people to come up and play against random strangers and see mm -hmm. how it went, and very enthusiastic, like, like, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, South American uh, soccer broadcasters, like oh no, it's little, little, <laughs> like rapid fire coverage of it, and it it's fun. It's a total carnival, but you know, there's crap tons of games that could never show well, and you see them, and it's always a sad like, you know, there's a guy passing through, and it's you know, yeah, you want to check out the game, and ah, uh, uh, well, and there's like this awkward like I don't want to disappoint you because it's just us in this moment. But honestly, no. <laughs> Indies can be really bad at it. Like, even some of their banners are just text. Like, yeah. sometimes they just, you walk past their booth and their whole banner is just text information. And it's like, you should have just had a cool image, man. <laughs> like you, you're putting people off from the jump. But it's a thing that mm. I've spoken to a ton of indies about. Uh, I did a workshop maybe two years ago for this kind of thing. It was uh, marketing and PR are not things that you can just do. They're not things that the person who wrote the code can just do and just be successful at. And when you send me an email that is, and I'm sure I've spoken about this on the show before because I get so many of them, that's, this game is Legend of Zelda meets Dark Souls is how every fucking indie emails press. And when you're all doing that, I don't read any of them. You have to, you have to do something different. And I feel like it's, it's, everyone thinks that they can mark it. And everyone thinks they can be a social media manager. I know that's a big thing where social media managers, I'm sure, have impossibly hard jobs and I can't imagine ever doing that for a living. Uh, that would be so rough, but everyone really thinks that they can do it. So many indies yep. don't don't think that they need to hire people to do marketing and PR, and they absolutely do. And then they get really frustrated when people aren't paying attention to their game because they know their game yep. is good, but they're not good at communicating to other people while their game is good, nor in a unique way. It always seems to be the exact, like I said, exact same headlines and emails. Or sometimes now what they've been doing is free code. That's how they try to get my attention in my email inbox. But again, when you're all doing that, I'm like, this is just too many codes. <laughs> like, I can't, I'm not going to play this game. This just, it just says the same thing as the other one. Uh, there has to be strategies around that. And I do feel like events are, like I said, probably really good exposure for, for indies. And um, I mean, Mike, you could speak to this, but one of the things about E3 going away that is a huge bummer is the amount of like back end business stuff that happens at an E3 or at a oh, DICE yeah. or at a GDC um, that is actually helpful for the indies or the double A's if they even exist anymore, where people are, you know, even pitching their games, getting their games off the ground. That stuff, yeah. that stuff being removed from those events is actually has a very bad impact on that part of the industry that really benefits from those events, the smaller guys. It's almost like we're increasing the gap if we like fully remove an E3. Yeah, I mean, DICE is weird because DICE will definitely... <clears throat> DICE will exist regardless of all this because and That's DICE true, as it's well, not it's not a public event, so it kind of it serves a completely different purpose. And, and But I don't imagine as many pitches happened this year. Like, I know a lot of pitches occur at DICE, but I don't imagine as many occurred this year since DICE was not in person. Oh, no, for know. sure. No, 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 for sure. Sorry, I, I, I thought you meant like after, after the... When, once it goes back on, I think DICE will return sure. fine. Um, but yeah, no, it's it is it is it. There, there definitely was kind of a musical chairs like at the start of COVID of everyone kind of going, okay, 
shit we can't do any of those things so we have to kind of like we have to get everything in a row so i know a lot of developers who were like okay we need to sign this project we need to lock this down we need to be doing this or whatever um because of exactly that that we we the the kind of the the gambits you can make throughout the year the kind of the those weird things that happen when you are talking to someone at a conference and you end up like you know pitching them an idea and, and it flies that's none of that organic stuff's happened um i yeah. don't think i don't think it'll i don't think consumers will spot a difference i don't think there'll be like a gap of releases or whatever but like yeah it's definitely knocks people i know a lot of people who were just getting started you know in you know similar boats to like the people who opened a restaurant just before all of this like if you didn't have your feet under you like you were kind of screwed by this whole situation I um see it. Yeah, it sucks. But it's, but it's, it's, yeah, hopefully that's all going to kind of come back. Dice will be dice. But dice, to be honest, because it's kind of an exclusive thing and, and kind of an expensive thing, wasn't really kind of a, you know, it's a not small that accessible indie anyway. Event. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of, yeah, you, the, the, the people. I can tell you. Go on. Well, no, I was just to, to piggyback on that um, is, you know, be, like someone in my position and any other freelancer is there's a parallel story to what you're describing because these conferences are always a valuable aggregator of the various people that I either know and have worked with or don't know and haven't yet worked with. But, you know, by chance we're in the same room together because I was having lunch with a friend and they said, Oh, do you know this person and that person? I mean, hell you and I chatting on a, on a beach in, in Croatia or whatever that was. 100% uh, true. Yeah. You guys went on like, a date in Croatia? We, we went on a date in Croatia. Was that the first time we met? Surely not. Surely that was your meet cute? Was our meet cute in Croatia? Like, what? It, it may have been. Well, I, I think I think I think, I think we knew each we, I think we, we internet we, knew each other and I think I Yeah, think, exactly. Like you Twitter, were flying in Twitter, and, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure yeah, it was it was basically Twitter DMs until that moment and it was like, "Hey, we're both at the same event. Let's meet up." Um, and, and like that kind of thing. And that's one where, you know, conscientiously seeking each other out because there's a recognition of, oh, we've never actually hung out before. We should fix that. Hmm. But, um, but, uh, other times it's, it's, yeah. Well, at other times it's, it's been such the organic, uh, uh, like I'm just with a friend and, and they'll say, Hey, I'm going over to this person's house. And it's like, oh, I don't even know them. Or I've always wanted to meet them or, or whatever, that kind of thing. And, and there's no, I don't know that there is any digital equivalent to that. People like, tried, just, right? Did you get invited to any of those kind of meetups and stuff? It just, it didn't, yeah, it was never I, the same. I it's, mean, um, it, yeah. the games industry gathering, I think, uh, put on by Guy Bloomberg just hit um, a year anniversary, I think. And it seems like that has been like pretty successful and it's gone pretty well. But like, I, you know, I've spoken to him about it. Just have no interest in talking to strangers digitally like that. I'd just be so uncomfortable. It's like chat roulette in a way. Uh, uh, yeah. If you remember that, does that even still exist? Chat- I'm Don't pretty sure it still exists. Every day, still. <laughs> does that? That's is how that I pretend. That still exists. That's how I, I don't even know how to find it. Like, no. is that like a website or like? <laughs> That's what led me to this. It just opened up a window, and the two of you were there, and I was like, I guess I'll stick if around. If something has porn on it, it probably still exists. <laughs> it's out there making money. It's doing just fine. Well, I except I the funny thing with chat roulette is it wasn't. I don't think it was designed for that, and it just stubbornly was like, "That's that's what it is. Yeah, just don't what, deny it." That's what happened with the Uno game on Xbox. Is it was just made for what? people to play Uno? Yeah, you could like integrate your webcam. I'm sure I've spoken about this before with the Uno on Xbox Live, and it was free for everyone. But then people just started having sex. <laughs> <laughs> Because you give well, a human a camera it. and it just happens no matter what. It's just inevitable. Someone's didn't that happen really masturbate. fast with, didn't that happen with the, with not the That's eye so toy, funny. but with the, um, the, like with, with, uh, there was a P, there was a specific PlayStation game around the time where the, where the, was it PS4 introduced the, the sh- streaming button and there was one game that like <laughs> you could stream with webcam full screen and again, instantly surprise me. went there. Yeah, it's. Humans. It's humans so, are fascinated yeah. by sex. <laughs> but Just yes, they are like it. a chat roulette. And I know there's Clubhouse, but I don't know. As someone who is like pretty significantly antisocial, the idea of just being digitally somewhere where you you just have to talk to strangers just sounds horrific. <laughs> like I don't want anything do to do it. with any of that. I, I've I've I, I joined Clubhouse. I, I, I don't go in there very often, mostly just because um it's 
basically impossible to multitask Clubhouse with what I do mm. because I, I sometimes will listen to podcasts where like there's a lot of technical nitty gritty work within what I do where I've, I'm, I've written a piece, but then I realize, okay, I need to do this or I want to change the nature of the effects, like the EQ on that plugin is not quite right. And there's like a lot of moments where there's no actual music happening. So I very often have podcasts and all manner of things queued up for those moments. And um, Clubhouse, because you can't pause, if you're yeah. not, you know, it's not it's not pre-recorded. It's like basically listening to the radio. And um, so on the one hand, I love that. I love the ephemeral nature of it. I love the conceit of what it offers, but it, it's, I haven't been able to really engage with it to the degree that I had hoped just by virtue of, if I have to pause, if I have to mute it to go back to work and then I come back, I have no idea what they're talking True. about anymore. True. So I, I, I don't, I don't uh, do it so often, but the nature of it that I, I have joined a few rooms and ended one, yeah. up in conversations with people. And I, I love it as a forum for contentious topics because it's, um, it has a different rule set. And, and, and I think the, the fact that people speak non anonymously has a very different vibe and, and tenor to it than Twitter, obviously, which is just a minefield of, of disaster. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and this, it's audio. Seen... Nobody can get their dick out. It's great. Yeah, people people grapple with things. I like going into rooms where they're arguing over like really difficult subjects, mm. you know, and, and, and people, you know, the better rooms, especially with really good moderators that are really kind of proactively taking it seriously, people try to earnestly get into, like, as you can imagine, there's been an enormous amount about what's going on in Israel. And there's like people on all sides of it saying like, well, you know, here's here's what you're missing, though. And it's like it, they're, they're not. It's not trying to score points. There's always some of that. But but I found, you know, at its best, it's a pretty good format. I, I will see if it really kind of I don't know how well it's doing as a platform, for example. Like, I don't know what its total user base is and stuff like that. But. It's fascinating to me that we went from radio to podcast was the next step. And then podcast was supposed to be like, <clears throat> it's radio, but you can listen to it anywhere and anyone can have access to it. And then Spotify d is kind of doing their damn best to take that away by now there are exclusive podcasts exclusive to different platforms just like the streaming wars you know how much joe rogan makes for a single episode of his podcast look all i'm saying it's, is it's so much do money. we do we want to insult spotify because you know anyway um this could all huge go, fan of what we love spotify doing spotify great space. like like actually i'd be honored really to work like with hey, them I, I if you, i had to uh, as a know. platform it's just great dream it's just great to work with spotify to make a million dollars an episode it's is it really nice? So a million an episode? I don't think it's a million, but it is. It is hundreds of thousands, if not a million. God. I did look it up not long ago. That's a lot it's of money like to sir. make talking absolute nonsense, isn't it? Oh my god! Oh, I'd love it. <laughs> but then, but so so that's gotten more restricted, and then Clubhouse comes along, which is like, what if you listened to it live? And we're like, well, yes, we have done that, <laughs> but they're just like reversing it. But theirs is still, I think, an invite-only system. So everyone's got these different barriers to entry on the thing. Um, and I worked on uh, public radio for three years in Australia um, on community radio. We were sponsored by the government, so we did get paid, which is pretty mm -hmm. neat. Now show had a little bit of funding. Mm -hmm. But even that was, it was broadcast nationally, but in, I think also in New Zealand and then one radio station in the UK. And mm -hmm. even that's a weird process of like, we could have broadcast that anyway. People are like, we're good. You're like, why would you not want the free content that you get about any of this and and generally they're like no we have licensing deals with other things so we can't just, just everything's just so fucking restricted in terms of broadcasting audio in a way that it never used to be that's pirate radio is dead effectively and replaced with clubhouse so you can go listen to elon musk talk about israel <laughs> or whatever but what, what what in what way do you think it's restricted i mean there if we want to do something that's all i mean oh well on clubhouse yeah. but oh i thought you were saying like when you say pirate radio is dead as if there's barriers to people putting out content, if they want to put it out. Oh, you can definitely still do that. I just think, uh, radio in general is, is I, I, this is completely a guess. I imagine on the decline, people are not listening to radio as much. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, I it's assume. aging up. So it is declining, but it's, it's staying static with the groups who are listening, but they're obviously aging out. And obviously there's a, a limit past which they stop listening. Um, yeah. So yeah. Which you, the mortal coil, mortal being, coil. They, they, they shuffle up. Anybody got a radio? Yeah, and it's then well, but isn't, podcast isn't networks. Under TV as well, right? Like every, basically everything. I was going to say, it, yeah, yeah, but aren't those? I mean, isn't radio once things like Sirius XM and whatnot became like you know cars 
are standard equipped to be able to receive those signals now and and that you know I'm, and i imagine anybody that's got some show that they're really into on these platforms you know they have it installed on whatever app on their phone mm -hmm. for when they're jogging and all that kind of stuff like sure. to me that's just radio evolving and mutating it just because it's moving away from the you know terrestrial radio literal giant broadcast af F am fm towers uh doesn't mean that i think the form is well the dead. issue so the issue no. is the walled garden and the proprietary platform right that's the that's the issue that the is inevitably happening is if as 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 it's consolidated as you have platforms paying for content as you have things being locked in under exclusivities and to be clear i'm a video game developer who makes console games like i'm definitely making products for walled gardens so i'm not knocking walled gardens as a concept but i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> I'm talking about uh, Soltech Conspiracy coming to Switch. Uh, people should play, should, should pre-order. Oh, and of course, yeah, Sony, there you go. But like the, the <laughs> crucially, like there's definitely, um, there is a change. There is a difference there. Like in podcasts, it's an interesting one because it's, it's, it's so quick. Like if you look at like, like, you know, people listening to this, uh, people watching this on YouTube are watching it on a proprietary platform. But if you're listening to the podcast, it's an RSS feed. You can listen to it on any device. You can, there's no limits or controls on who can and can't listen to it. Um, and therefore it's a kind of a free form thing, kind of like broadcasting from a, from a, from an old radio device. Right. But then, you know, with Spotify, they control their ecosystem. They limit, you can't listen to Joe Rogan on iTunes. If you're not someone who's in the Spotify right. ecosystem, you're locked out. Um, it's probably not a terrible thing. It's probably you can listen to other podcasts, which are much better. But the um... <laughs> there's also, I think, very few. He he's an exception. I, sure. There's not that many that are hard exclusives. No, in that but way. it's no. a trend. I think it's definitely a trend. Yeah. And and if you look at, you can see the same with um, Amazon, for example, are buying up a lot of podcast companies. There's a lot of companies that are starting to acquire these. Setups. Never mind buying MGM. Well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's the that's the legacy content. That's the uh, yeah, but. Well, in the future of at least the Bond franchise. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, That's the only thing that I ever think of. That's the only one that I was like, oh, Bond. <laughs> I don't know what else they even have. Stargate. There'll Stargate? be five Stargate <laughs> streaming shows. Yeah, probably, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely evolved, um, but not in a way that I like feel any... Like, I'm not like old man yells at cloud like mm -hmm. radio's dying even though i had a great time working on radio you know that format changing we still do this show that i can publish on virtually any platform really uh, i don't think i could publish it on clubhouse because it has to be live i think but we could stream it you know it's not like it's tremendously restricted um it's just an interesting evolution of that and and watching the way that people monetize change i think is the thing i found the most fascinating is the way that monetize that radio was monetized for us, like I said, the show was government funded, but we never had any ads or made any revenue on that show, uh, which was awesome, right. hmm. very fun. Um, but now, do I think something would be government funded that would exist on podcasts or, or Clubhouse unless it was like an ABC News? Probably not. Well, that's Even the weird that, thing. I think I'm very used accessible. to that. Like the bulk of like, a, well, not the bulk, a large amount of entertainment in the UK is government funded. Yeah, sponsored isn't the right word for that though, right? Like, so we do have that in Australia too. It's government government funded, but not sponsored. Yeah, <laughs> technically. Well, but like, like there's, yeah, there's a gray area there for sure in terms of process. But yeah, it's um. It's true. What What would be the difference? I mean, sponsored. Does that entail some form of endorsement? There's a or yeah. The, the the implication. I don't know what it is in Australia, but in the UK, the in theory British. <clears throat> uh, so we're talking about the BBC, so the, the the British Broadcasting Corporation. But the there's also all of our other channels have some degree of public money. The terrestrial ones, so like ITV Channel Four, will take those 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 resources. In theory, there's no government oversight of programming. In theory, um, of course there yeah. are. Yeah, there same. is Yeah. So, so that's the difference. Sponsored it's, means it's in government has a say. Sponsored, but. you control content, or at least you have, you know, you know, if you're, if if we had a sponsor on this podcast, they would absolutely have expectations of the kind of content we were and were not doing on the show. Um, sure. Where, but you're saying if it's labeled government funded, that's looser in the yeah. UK. So it's technically it's I don't know again with is it a license fee in Australia? Not sure. But I, I know that it is it is looser, yes, that they don't have any control over what anyone says. So, like, our uh, government-funded news networks are allowed to criticize the government all they like and would never get in any trouble for it. But you could definitely make a strong argument that because the money, ultimately the budget for those news programs, is controlled by the government, at least in the Uk there is 
there is likely a pro-government stance, you know, in BBC News programming. Not completely, it's not like state propaganda, but there's definitely like right. biases mm-hmm. will creep in, you know, ultimately by yeah, any kind sure. of impact. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah. I'm going to circle back to, to E3 as much as this conversation that we just got on was very interesting. That, that's what people um, tune about... in for is our views on radio broadcast <laughs> politics. That's um... Yeah, and how things have changed. Yeah. Um, I, you know, we, we spoke about how this kind of, um, how it affects indies in the space. I'm just trying, I was thinking just like, even while we were talking about this, how, what other ways are things affected? <clears throat> so like for press, E3 again at IGN made so much money in that one week that you probably could have kept the, the site afloat. Is that just in terms uh, of advertising on the site and stuff? Is that, yeah. Tremendous amount of advertising. Right. Um, the other thing that makes IGN the most money is wikis. Uh, the site could keep itself afloat just with the wikis. Really? The That's interesting. Yeah. Which is wild because it's such a small team and they absolutely work crunch. Um, maybe they've stopped. Uh, I did see that they had tried to, at least with Cyberpunk, but uh, yeah, they... they there's, Do those so much are, work. I, I gotta say, as someone who had no interest in remembering how to do the uh, uh, core puzzle restore uh, thing in Mass Effect 1, mm-hmm. uh, you know what I'm talking about? Where you go down into the core and there's yep. the three columns. Shit took me ages. That was, I, it took me ages back in the day, and I was like, IGN Wiki fucking... Just spoon feed me this because I don't have time for this yeah, shit. Yeah, if you've already and done I, it. But, I, but, I, but yeah, but for some reason that didn't translate to I'm going to use my Omni Gel, uh, mm. it, which I had plenty of. Mm. Uh, I love how by the time I reach the end of that game, I have like like straight nines in credits and maxed out everything and there's just nowhere to go. And yet I won't. I still somehow won't spend the, the – I'm like I got to sell these parts and get rid of this junk and uh, – Anyway, it's very silly. <laughs> but yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, IG and Wiki department, for saving me 10 minutes or whatever of probably re- like 40 minutes of It's a lot tedium. of a lot of work. Um, but yeah, obviously, outside of that, E3 makes IG and a ton of money. For me, where it comes to content creation stuff, I would say outside of console launches last year, which would happen for every console launch, um, E3 will get me the most subscribers in a two week period of time. So E3 coverage, I will get more YouTube subscribers than at any other point in the year. I don't know that it directly translates to money because I don't monetize that way, but that has happened for several years in a row um, when it's calculated to one specific week. Uh, And I'm trying to think of any other industries that would be impacted in that significant way. Obviously, like whatever industry is building the boots, I mean, they must make a ton of money. I don't know how complicated that stuff mm-hmm. is. All of the people who work on the show floor, like on hand to do that construction, that's a loss. But I'm trying to think of other facets of the industry that are impacted by E3 not being contained to a week. Like Austin, does it impact your job if E3 disappears? Primarily in the way I spoke of a minute ago, you know, every every year... I, I've gone down to E3 most every year, but very rarely do I actually get a badge and go inside mm-hmm. because I'm just meeting at the one of the restaurants nearby folks that are in town because they don't live in L.A. And so that and sometimes kind of like with the story with Mike, sometimes that ends up directly translating by happenstance or, or deliberate like, you know, hey, I'd, I know you're looking for somebody right now. You know, if you got time, I'd love to have a coffee, you know, because they're actively looking for a composer and so Mm -hmm. we decide to go have a conversation so in those ways it affects me but um um obviously you know especially if it's one of those where somebody's keen if to have a conversation there's no barrier to that you know i can jump on a zoom if somebody actively wants to talk to me but it's the it's the it's the people that don't know we where we haven't met or we don't know we would meet that's where it impacts and that's an un that's an unknown unquantifiable variable i don't know what I haven't yeah. been able to, <laughs> yeah. to, to do. You don't know what you've lost. Um, yeah, exactly. If anything, or, you know, it could be, it could be anywhere from I've lost a lot to nothing. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, but that said it's other, otherwise for me, it's primarily the selfish. I don't know that it has any other direct. Um, well, there's only two other ways that I could think of that it, that it um, potentially messes with me, which is that every now and again, we'll do, like a launch trailer, you know, uh, like shenanigan. Like I remember uh, 
uh, on the Banner Saga 2, I had a I conducted a live choir on stage at that then handed off to the to the video and rolled the trailer. Um, and so it was like a stunt, you know, it was a, it was a way to make it cool. Um, there's no real, you know, press publish on YouTube equivalent to that. It's still just watching a YouTube video. But the idea of, you know, we're going to do and, and this has been this has been done. Uh, before you know they did a the, with at the reveal of of God of War you know they had they had an orchestra like a pit orchestra yeah. with bear conducting you know for like five minutes before the before it started where they didn't they just played the music without saying what the game was and then finally after like building 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 you know reveal logo which was a cool stunt so like to the extent that I get pulled into things like that which I love doing I enjoy these these kind of showy ridiculous things they're very fun um uh, those we miss out on those opportunities mm. to to a degree because it's not quite the same as baking it into the video itself. You know, like filming an orchestra and then throwing to the trailer. It just it's just gonna go straight to the trailer. Yeah. Uh, in most cases, so that aspect. But then the other, selfishly, it's just I enjoy seeing people. I I even enjoy. I didn't used to, but I've come to really enjoy the chaos of the show floor mm -hmm. and just kind of and especially when there's people there who like this was something that on Hilo was a wonderful gateway to where she, she, you know, she has friends, especially throughout South and Central America mm -hmm. where, you know, they're like working on, you know, the IGN Brazil team mm -hmm. or something like that. And so for the, the, it's like been their dream of their life to yeah. come to an IGN and they, they're there that year. And I've had, I've met people like where they're walking around just like, I can't believe this is real. Yeah. That I'm I'm here right now and I'm seeing this. I've loved games and I've loved this industry since I was five. I've pursued it as a career, but you know where I'm from, they we don't do things like this. And finally, my you know my work brought me, or I just saved up my money and brought myself. And like, I really really love. I I get a lot of kind of osmosis, vicarious re-ignition totally. of my excitement no, I do. And you're absolutely right. That's the thing I like feel that. bad for people for. Like, because again, like yeah. British, right? So like, I didn't go to my first E3 until like after Thomas Was Alone came out. My first GDC until after that, you know, because you I couldn't afford to. And ditto on like yeah. comic cons and stuff. Like, like there is definitely like a, a homecoming for nerds who've like grown up watching this stuff, sharing this stuff. I remember going to my first comic con um San Diego Comic Con and like being there with uh, my my boss and, and friend kind of at the time kind of sorry my boss at the time my still friend clear that up um <laughs> and, and like standing <laughs> in the hotel and being and him turning to me and like being can you like can you believe we're at like Comic Con like it's the and it was San Diego Comic Con so it's the big San, the big Comic Con and I said this is this is this couldn't be any more perfect and then Kevin Smith walked past the window I was like, now we're Wild. at Comic Con. <laughs> um, yeah. and it's like, and it's yeah, like yeah. that's the like that's an experience that yeah, that's a big deal for people. And yeah, there will be a generation of people who this was their year to. But I guess they'll get it, you know, another time. But yeah, hopefully, yeah, yeah that formats. that part is. Yeah, it's it's it that those moments for me have become the highlight. I had know? that. I so. loved it, and I think I I totally agree. Like I would say, as press. Uh, when I was or even when doing content creation stuff, everything being digital and spread apart is easier for me. Mm. It makes doing that content very, very easy aside from the time zones in Australia, which is a real bitch. <laughs> but outside of that, it makes it really simple. Um, what time is it there now? What, what? It's 4.30 a.m., which means, Austin, you and I need to go. We have things that we need to do. But um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I strongly well. agree. That, what the hell that, is that? Yeah, I have things sure I could do. do. Jeez. What are you gonna do? Go take a nap. It's Friday night for me. You know, I don't <laughs> Yeah, You'll be fine. <laughs> um, but hey, I, I agree that the paint, excitement paint of E3... Manchester red. <laughs> the, right. the excitement of E3 is the thing that I love. And I always said, like, if I if I became one of those cynical people who's like, oh, E3, I hate E3, then I was like, I shouldn't work in the games industry mm. anymore. The minute I stopped being excited exactly. about it, I shouldn't do it because I love E3. It is super exciting. They did dox me, which was a bit of a bummer. Oh, were you caught up in all um, of that? Shit. Yeah, thankfully it w I put my work address in, but it was my personal phone number, and I had uh, I found a conspiracy where I kept missing phone calls that looked like they were from Australia, and their plan was to convince me that one of my parents had died and that I had to fly home. This was the plan that they had listed on a forum: was keep calling her from Australian numbers, tell her that her mum has died in a car accident, so she thinks she has to fly home. And that was just a fun, a fun, a fun, the, cool thing that they thought was that, that they a would prank, do. or was that like was there an end game? No, it was like... just it was just a prank. 
just, was this the I think once you cross the line the into opening? that plan, you're probably not completely there, Austin, in terms of no, it was just pieces making. of shit. Yeah, you're just. <laughs> but a piece thankfully, of shit. I didn't I didn't answer any of them, and I was like, this is, and I got so many text messages. Otherwise, it was completely fine. Um, I wonder if that's how uh, your mysterious uh, film composer, who is definitely, most certainly not me. <laughs> definitely not Austin. Uh, was, uh, I wonder if that's how they got a hold of your number. So funny. Um, all right, I have to roll to another meeting. Uh, thank you, guys. This is Play, Watch, Listen, I guess. <laughs> I'm Alana, that's Mike Middle, and that's Austin Rich. We will see you next time. Bye. Bye. No Troy. No Troy. All right, buddy.